Hi, everyone. Uh, we're just admitting people into the room. Um, oh, is it already recording? Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carmel Mipris, and I am CANDU Certification Coordinator. I just wanted to let you know that this session is being recorded, and it will be available to everybody who's registered um, after the webinar is completed. And um, I'm sorry, just a long day. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Can Do, we are a nonprofit non or Indigenous organization that is membership driven and overseen by a board of directors. Um, we focus on community economic development and are constantly looking for new and innovative ways to offer training opportunities in capacity development to First Nations across Canada. This webinar is funded by Natural Resource Canada and um, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. His name is Dave Halefi Bure and Dave has more than 30 years of experience with government geoscience surveys and mineral exploration companies and economic geologist. He is knowledgeable about a wide variety of mineral, industrial mineral, and coal deposits. So with that being said, Dave, do you want to take over? Yes, thanks, Carmel. Uh, just before I say something, Paul, is there anything you need to say to the participants? No, I think we're good. Um, we're good? Yeah, we're good to go. Okay, good, thanks. So yes, my name is Dave Lafabure, and uh, I live in British Columbia on Salt Spring Island. Uh, ancestral and traditional uh, territory of the Coast Salish people and uh, of the peoples that speak of, uh, speak in the Huquakunum and Seneca speaking languages. And so uh, it's my privilege to make this presentation today. Uh, it's directed at economic development officers and it's designed to introduce you to understand mineral exploration and mining, the mining sector and the opportunities that relate to it. And I'll just uh, set up my presentation here. I'm gonna take control of the screen and I'm going to take, choose that, share, and I just need to go like this. So are we, yeah, here we go. So today I will be talking about mining and equals opportunity for indigenous communities in Saskatchewan. And uh, the, I will I'm going to focus on that uh, rather than sort of the broader understanding of, of the mining sector and the various parts of it but I am gonna give you quite a bit of information about uh, mineral exploration and mining. Um, we need to be aware that minerals are very important in modern life. Uh, we can think of high-tech applications like cell phones, computers, tantalum, a mineral you may not have even heard of, a metallic mineral, uh, cesium, uh, pellus uh, and pellucite, which are two sort of similar minerals that are in a family. They're also important in these high-tech applications. But overall, even with the sort of more common metals like copper and silver and gold, and with uh, uh, maybe more exotic, sometimes industrial minerals, uh, uh, we are using more minerals in our everyday life in modern society. They become more important to us in terms of our daily lives. And so uh, we need them as a society. We need them uh, in terms of trying to combat greenhouse uh, gases and and move, uh, build wind turbines and solar cells. So today I'm gonna to talk about opportunities for indigenous mining jobs, businesses, and uh, agreements in Saskatchewan. Uh, that'll be sort of the first third of it. And then we'll have a question and answer session. Then I'll talk about the life cycle of mining related to Saskatchewan and potential economic opportunities for indigenous uh, uh, communities. And then end with a few key points relevant to economic development officers related to mining. And then we'll have a final question and answer session. Uh, and if you wish to, uh, if you wish to ask a question at any time, go ahead and put it in the chat box, and then we'll either let you ask it when we get to a question and answer period, or you can have one of the moderators ask the question on your behalf. So why talk about mining? Four reasons I can think of for economic development officers. First is jobs and contracts. Mining is the number two employer of Indigenous people in Canada. Uh, the number one employer, you might guess, is governments, uh, particularly the federal government. Uh, numerous agreements have been made between mining uh, companies and indigenous communities across Canada. It depends on the province you're in or the territory you're in as to how many, but there have been quite a few, and I'll talk about that briefly. Because that doesn't necessarily involve economic development officers so much, I'm going to not 
dwell on that too much. You'll see a bit of information about that, but they are very important. Uh, and I think you'll be impressed with how many agreements there are that are active across Canada these days. Mines are spread across Saskatchewan. And so this is a sector you might not have thought of that way, but it's found in remote areas, rural areas, and sometimes suburban locations, if you think of sand and gravel quarries. So there's opportunities that you might not have been aware of in your neighborhood, because unfortunately the mining sector is not well known. Many people have never visited a mine or learned about them. Many people are like me. I, there's nobody in my family who was ever a geologist, which I am, or worked, uh, worked at a mine. And so uh, I have family members that do not know much about the mining sector. But there are significant economic development opportunities. So it's uh, something we like to see. Uh, so we talk about Indigenous employment in Saskatchewan mines. 21% of Saskatchewan mine employees are Indigenous. Uh, that figure is a little bit older, but it comes from uh, uh, some information provided by one of the mining associations. And that's a, a very much, as we think back to the numbers, that's a very significant uh, source of employment for Indigenous people. For every mining job, we need to also remember there are at least two jobs away from the mine site in the mining supply and service sector. So in Saskatchewan, that comes out to being about 18,000 jobs uh, in the, related to the mineral sector. It is the third largest industry in the province. And so that's, again, another reason why it's important in Saskatchewan. These jobs can actually be quite attractive. And I'll show you a few slides to sort of give you a better sense of that. They can help you build work, work, work skills. If the, or for these larger mines and, and larger companies working, you can sort of work your way through, get training and uh, build your work skills. They're not all uh, the traditional mining jobs you might think about. And jobs exist in virtually all regions of the province including near northern communities. So that's, that helps, uh, uh, it's useful. So a wide variety of jobs there on the top left-hand corner, there's a traditional underground miner uh, and you with the mine, miner's hat and lamp, uh, but there are jobs in uh, sand and gravel operations, which are more like uh, construction and uh, excavation. There are jobs in exploration where in this case, they're being uh, moved around and supplied by a helicopter in a remote location. And obviously there are support jobs. If I go to a, a listing of the wide variety of mine jobs, you can see, yes, there's mine, people working in the mine, but there's also the mill and the shop using trades and uh, other types of uh, jobs, uh, janitors, a whole spectrum of them and, and certainly potential to move through the ranks in terms of learning and work skills. There's people needed in offices. There's, uh, if it's in a remote location, there's gonna be a camp and all the sort of uh, people related to that. Uh, you might not think about it, but security is going to be a, a, an aspect of any sort of remote camp, whether it's mining or otherwise, or on, on uh, industrial sites and roads. So there's, so one estimate is there's about 160 60 different mine jobs. So, so that it can be quite attractive. Uh, there are these career profiles that come from uh, the Saskatchewan Mining Association. I'm going to show you some. At the end of this presentation, we'll have links that uh, will be circulated in a format that you can read later, uh, but you're quite fortunate in Saskatchewan that there are career profiles that relate to uh, mining. And so there's a, a general maintenance operator, uh, a professional uh, procurement specialist. So this would be somebody who's dealing with outside companies, which could be indigenous uh, to acquire the supplies that the mine needs. Uh, and then there's an indigenous business manager, relations manager and uh, a geological technician. Just so just giving you a feeling for some of the types of jobs that are potential there. The second reason is, well, goods and service contracts. Saskatchewan Mines in 2017 purchased $649 million worth of goods and services from indigenous owned businesses. That's a lot of uh, activity and one might feel if your community isn't getting involved in that, there might be opportunity. And this happens because mines need a lot of goods. They could be, uh, food or gravel, could be vehicles and parts, but could be also small things like signs. Uh, mines off, also often contract out specific services that are really not core to their work. So that could be snow removal, could be security. So again, those are outside contractors who come in, work with the mine and deliver those services. Um, and companies of various sizes can bid on these contracts, particularly for some of the smaller ones. Uh, I am aware of uh, one place in Ontario where the, an Indigenous community is providing Pickets, which are they use to mark blast holes, and that's all they do. But that's that's uh, keeps their small part of their small business going. Many mines prefer to use local companies. 
uh, often they're more efficient, more connected to the mine, but they also reckon the recognize the value of using indigenous companies. And that's become more of a trend with companies being uh, cognizant of the importance of uh, working with uh, and supporting indigenous communities. So here's the first example, of some of the ones I'll be showing you uh, of uh, indigenous business. This is the Kitsaki Management Limited Partnership. It's the business arm of the Lac La Range Indian Band. Uh, it's done independent and community monitoring programs in Northern Saskatchewan for nearly two decades. In this case, uh, the mining companies have asked Can North to do uh, uh, collect both technical and community samples to make sure that uh, none of their activities are endangering the health and welfare of the local communities. Uh, it was established in 1997 with the support of Cameco and other uranium mining companies in Northern Saskatchewan. So Can North now would be uh, quite a strong uh, organization uh, on, uh, on their own and would have branched out and doing other things, but they were able to, to get started by having this relationship with Cameco and these other companies and they're still uh, working with them. There's the Athabasca Basin development. This is owned by seven communities in the Athabasca area in Northern Saskatchewan. They're largely Dene First Nation communities. You can read the names there. Uh, and this was established to maximize, maximize local community participation in the opportunities in the mining industry. And you can see on the right, some of the, the, uh, the companies that they've developed, which are having either, uh, usually have like 51% or more ownership by Athabasca Basin Development. Some of them have been done in, in joint venture. Uh, we'll see team drilling later. And so they, they joint venture with a company that, had, company that had drilling expertise to form team, team drilling. Uh, they've retained a 51% interest but uh, the other 49% and the initial expertise has come from the company I joined with. We talk about Indigenous Community Active Mining Agreements. This is a uh, federal government map that they uh, put out to show, and this is just the active agreements. Uh, so impact and benefit agreements, participation agreements, letter of intent, uh, quite a variety here. Uh, here you can see in Saskatchewan, uh, there are a number of, of agreements that have been uh, made between Indigenous communities and uh, mineral exploration or mining companies. Uh, you in, we can't do it here, but on the live version, you can click on that dot and you'll get some basic information about the type of agreement, who are the two partners or more involved in it, the uh, timing on it and information like that. I've just shown two to show you here. This is where I clicked. I've expanded just part of it. You can see here, they're both, uh, this is um, a project for Encanto Potash Corp. You can get more information about Encanto, Encanto Potash here. It's with the Moscow Patung First Nation and it's an impact and benefits agreement, which is one of the higher level ones, perhaps in some ways in terms of significant. Uh, and uh, in this other one, you can see BHP Billiton, a very large mining company, and it has a big project I'll be talking about later called Janssen. I'll show you a few pictures. And it, this is a, uh, and other some sort of special agreement with uh, three, three First Nations. So mining in Saskatchewan, I would say it's all over Saskatchewan. Uh, this is from the set, a map from Saskatchewan Geological Survey. And this is the area where you find the potash mines. There's Regina, there's um, uh, Saskatoon, and there's quite a large area with both uh, potash mines and potential mines. There were some mine development projects in that area. Uh, potash is the number one mineral product from uh, Saskatchewan. Operating uranium mines are all in this area here, up in uh, northern uh, Saskatchewan. You see this yellow area, that's a geology map. There's actually all around the edge of that yellow area, including Uranium City up and about here, there is uranium mineralization, but so far, other than the Clough Lake mine that's composed, there has been no uh, there's some exciting discoveries, and, uh, but no, no mines at this point in time. And here you can see a listing of all of the mines and mineral exploration projects for 2020 in the province. Um, so quite a bit of, quite a number of players. Some of them are quite small, and it, this, this listing would not cover sand and gravel pits because there's probably in the order of four or 500 sand and gravel pits in Saskatchewan. So mine products in Saskatchewan, we have potash, which I talked about, you can sort of see this reddish uh, material here is some of the, the, the potash that's come out of this underground mine. You can see uranium, metals, so metals like uh, 
copper or gold. Industrial minerals, these can be rocks like limestone, uh, it can be salts, it can be a number of minerals. Potash is a type of industrial mineral, but it's so significant in uh, Sus Saskatchewan and a global context from Saskatchewan that I've chosen to profile it separately. You've got coal that's being burned in southern Saskatchewan to generate electricity, and you have sand and gravel or aggregate, another term for it. So we've got continuing with this mining all over Saskatchewan. I thought I should show you. So in terms of potential, uh, this is the area in northern Saskatchewan where you might find uranium. So the mines are more over in this area here. Um, my circle is probably not 100% accurate there. Uh, there's gold uh, in this part of the province. Larange is in this area, and I'll come back to that, but there's gold potential there. The reality is more exploration should be done in other parts of Saskatchewan, which might show that there's more potential for gold elsewhere. Uh, and then there's this area for copper, zinc, and nickel, and you, a number of you will know about Flintflon, uh, and that's where uh, on both the Manitoba side and Saskatchewan side, there's been copper and zinc uh, production, and uh, there has been nickel production primarily on the Manitoba side, but there is some potential on the Saskatchewan side. If you go to the south, okay, we're moving away from metals, and we're starting to talk about other things. One of the neat things is diamonds. Near Prince Albert, there is, and I'll show you a picture later, talk about that a bit more. There is a uh, company that's in the process of trying to uh, develop a series of rocks that have diamonds in them and turn it into the first diamond mine in Saskatchewan. Um, and we'll see if that, if they are gonna be successful. There is some peat that is uh, uh, classified along with the, the minerals produced in Saskatchewan used in agriculture products. There's potash, which I talked about before. There's also salt produced in southwestern Saskatchewan, quite a bit of salt, uh, and I'll come back to that. There are clay minerals that are used uh, in ceramics and other products, and uh, Saskatchewan has that. I didn't put, I didn't show you the location for helium because the map was getting uh, pretty uh, complex, but you do produce some helium, which is a critical element, and uh, also, there's the coal I mentioned in the extreme southern part of the province. So quite a variety. And if you sort of think about it, there's, it, it covers quite a bit of it. Uh, I haven't, the sand and gravel um, is, uh, does cover more than the area I've shown here. Anywhere you have roads, there will be sand and gravel pits. So it's a bit more extensive than, than I've shown there. So mining commodities 2021, you've got uranium. It's a metal, but it's also an energy product. So it tends to sit in both places. You've got gold, copper, zinc uh, that are being produced at mines. Then you have coal. It's a, it's a thermal type of coal used to produce energy. Uh, they are sequestering all the CO2 from at least one of those mines, if not all the mines related to that operation to try and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that. A number of minerals and rocks and uh, construction materials. And I just mentioned that. There's a, the potash minerals. That's what it looks like when you just take it from the face and the underground. It's actually, sylvite is the, uh, the uh, mineral that's the embl embl emblematic of Saskatchewan. Mine not well known, well, it's not taught in the schools. Many mines are in remote rural areas, so a lot of people don't see them. Uh, these are often, and well, they're all, all the surface mines are industrial sites that need, where you need to restrict access for safety reasons. Uh, it, Having said that, mining is the safest heavy industry in Canada. And in fact, the Saskatchewan, when I did a workshop there in Saskatoon and got prepared, got the statistics, what I learned is that tr traditionally in, in uh, Saskatchewan, it's actually in terms of lost time accidents, it's more dangerous to be a government employee uh, than it is to work at a mine in Saskatchewan, that, which sort of blew me away since I was a long time government employee as part of my history. Uh, mining products are often processed to a metal or a mineral product before they reach the customer. And so, you know, a coin, you know, that's metal and it came from a mine, but you don't necessarily think about it. But a lot of other products, if it's not made out of plastic, like the wallboard in, the, in, the, in my room and probably in the room you're in, it's mostly gypsum. It's an industrial mineral product, but we don't think of it as being a mine product. And I'd say the mining sector could do a better job of, uh, of spending time uh, explaining what they do, but they're focusing on the job at hand. Do you know, and do you know the following highlights, sorry, about the mining sector in Saskatchewan? Well, it's the second largest potash producer worldwide, which is amazing. 
uh, just one province uh, lead, becoming second in the world. And it's actually the largest uh, producing jurisdiction for potash. I just learned that. Uh, I've had some help in pre preparing this presentation from the Saskatchewan uh, Geological Survey and Jason Berani in particular uh, both pointed that out but has helped me with some points on this presentation. It's the world's second largest uranium producer uh, and uh, it has 15 potash, uranium and coal mines and numerous quarries and pits. And the annual value of mining is 7.4 billion. If you look at the little graphic on the right here, um, you'll see that it's, um, right, uh, you'll see that it's, uh, potash is worth over $6 billion in value in terms of production. Uranium is second with uh, uh, 710 uh, million, uh, thousand, uh, 0.7 billion dollars, better way to say it, of uh, uh, production. And then uh, you have $400 million of production of other minerals. So that's not insignificant. And if it's in your neighborhood, uh, you're more than happy to have part of that 400 million. But uh, uh, certainly the potash industry is number one. And that's why uh, we're seeing some of those agreements with uh, First Nations in Saskatchewan. So this takes us to the question and answer period. Uh, Carmel is going to take us through that. Uh, so I'll throw it back to Carmel. I, don't, I think I can leave the screen where it is, but it's over to you, Carmel. Hi everyone. Um, for those of you who just joined us, just wanted to remind you that this session is being recorded. And um, if you do have any questions at this moment, um, please share. Um, you can use the chat box or um, just unmute yourself and turn your camera on if you like. Just wanted to let you know that we will be having a follow-up email after the session. Um, just thanking you for attending and there will be a survey. Um, and for those of you that complete the survey, there will be a draw tomorrow for a chance uh, for two winners to win a chance of $400 for completing the survey. Um, do we have any questions? Okay, well, it's fine. Okay, Dave, if you are um, more than welcome to continue if you like. Well, okay, well, maybe that means everything I said was pretty clear and, and you're, you're following along. Uh, we're gonna be going through uh, the talking about the life cycle of mining now, and I will be interspersing information that explains how you get from an initial discovery through exploration to prove you have a resource to developing a mine uh, and uh, then uh, bring the mine into production and closing it. Um, so, but before I do that, uh, I need to say that today I'm talking about mining opportunities. We don't have enough time to cover other aspects of mining, and we know that mining, uh, particularly larger mines, are large industrial operations, and so they can have uh, there can be a concern about them for various reasons. And so, uh, and so that you know, when I do a full day workshop, uh, we're able to explore those other aspects. For today, I'm just focusing on the opportunities within the context of the time available. Uh, but uh, you, as an economic development officer. For, for your First Nation and, and for whatever you're involved in, I, I, I think you need to be prepared to ask questions, to ask hard questions, and to understand the full context of uh, mineral exploration or mining project uh, or site that you're looking at. Government has a big role in... Uh, Dave. Um, yeah, sorry, I just see somehow I, yeah. I need to... Yeah, that's my apologies. I thought Paul was doing that. That's I must have done that, sorry. Uh, so government role in exploration and mining, uh, the, through confederation, it's the provinces and the territories that uh, largely regulate uh, uh, exploration, act, exploration and mining activities. They're responsible for the uh, mineral values in the ground in the province or territory and also the government activities. And this, can, this includes administering the mineral claims. Uh, it does include uh, geological surveys that generate maps and reports that help prospectors and, and geology, uh, geology companies to decide where to explore. It permits mine developments and mines. It enforces safety regulations and assists with mine training. And so Canada uh, internationally is, actually has some of the safest uh, mines, if not uh, right at the top of being the safest mines in the world. They also in re recent years, recent decades, have required reclamation plans for mines before they are uh, start to be developed. Uh, and they require uh, reclamation bonds for mines, uh, which is a case where the company puts money into a bank account that they can only access if they have uh, re 
close to reclaim the mine properly. Uh, if they, uh, excuse me, I'm just going to close this door. Um, the, uh, and so those funds are there in case the company uh, does not have the funds towards the end of the life of the mine to reclaim it. And so that's a, a very important uh, aspect in terms of modern mines is that government will have the funds to reclaim a mine properly if uh, the company doesn't do it. Most companies now are, are well in tune with this and do reclaim their sites. So, but it is safety we need. Federal government, they only administer mineral rights on reserves. Uh, they uh, can participate in environmental assessments of major mine proposals where there's an interest uh, with uh, that particular project that is a federal interest. Uh, and they help uh, administer uh, underground exploration mining processing and other activities uh, related to uranium because of this uh, potential health uh, hazard. So in particular, they play a big role in uh, administering transportation of, of any of the um, uh, uranium products coming from the mine. Sorry, let's go. So access to land for mineral exploration. Uh, you register a mineral tenure with the government to attain ownership for the metals and, and some minerals that are uh, beneath the surface. No mineral tenures are allowed on Indian reserves, parks in some special protected areas, temporary areas under study by government, crown reserves for potash and oil and gas, and that's it's quite complex if you get into southern BC where there are overlaying, uh, there are areas for different types of um, minerals that are not covered by the, uh, uh, the mineral tenure uh, we're talking about here. And some private lands are excluded from claim acquisition. So about 13% of Saskatchewan in 2020 was held by this specific type of tenure, which does not include potash, does not include oil and gas. Uh, but these uh, hope does include most other minerals and metals and uh, aggregate. So how do they do this? Well, in the south, they uh, use the survey township grid and you would actually identify that you want a claim that covers uh, one of those uh, township uh, lots in, in, in there. If you go to the north, it's actually a digital grid developed because it's an unsurveyed unsur part of the province. And you would choose on a computer a particular number of what we usually call cells or grid cells here, what they call LSD uh, grid cells. And that gets filed electronically. And information for both the North and the South is available online. So for public as well as uh, the people working in the industry. So you can see who owns, uh, who has acquired what tenure throughout the province. And there's, there's an example of what you would see on your computer screen if you went online and uh, wanted to see whether there were any claims staked in your area, or if you're in a prospect or an exploration company, you wanna see if the ground is open so you can acquire it, if you're interested in acquiring. So talking about life cycle of mining, we've got prospecting and early exploration. There you can see two prospectors. Uh, if this was British Columbia and for certain parts of Saskatchewan, they would have probably turned up in a truck and hiking along a, perhaps a logging road in Saskatchewan. Uh, they may have you know, had to, use water access for some of the more remote areas. Uh, you see they're garbed for the weather and they, they're carrying some long hand, handled rock uh, hammer grub hose so that they can actually dig up a new outcrop. Then we go to advanced exploration. We, there we can see some winter drilling on ice. Uh, and that's where we tend to get uh, much more information about what's under the ground. You go into un, uh, develop mine development. This is an opening to an underground mine. Then you get to mining. There's a head frame actually potash head frame from southern Saskatchewan. And then we get to mine closure and reclamation. And that is your uh, mining life cycle, uh, which uh, we'll be going through now, showing you some examples of the activity and in some indigenous uh, companies or communities are benefiting from it. One of the important thing is to realize that uh, I know indigenous prospectors. There are indigenous companies that work through the sequence of advanced exploration, mine developed mining, and uh, actually there are indigenous companies involved with mine closure and reclamation. And that can be particularly uh, appropriate as explained later to uh, local businesses when you get to that stage, which you might not have thought of before. So prospecting, we're gonna do mineral exploration. Here's the path line. So generally a prospector would go out and break a lot of rock and is looking to see if they can find metals or uh, some other mineral in the rock that's of interest. 
We then go, uh, it, as KTIs start to get involved with junior exploration companies, which I'll talk about a little bit later. We go to sampling. It could be of soil. It could be of silts here from a stream. Uh, it can be a rock. And what you're looking is for small amounts of, of the metal of interest or the mineral you're looking for that you can then sort of start mapping it on the surface that locally to figure out where to go to find more of it, thinking that, okay, this is eventually going to lead me to a deposit beneath the Earth's surface that I can mine. Then we have geophysics. It's a way of using uh, special techniques that send signals into the Earth's crust and can tell geologists and geophysicists uh, something about the nature of the Earth's crust and sometimes tell you that there's a likely to be some mineralized rock uh, at depth that you should drill. And then we're showing the drilling again. And you can think about the drilling as though if you had a layered birthday cake uh, and you wanted to know what was inside it, if you took a nice strong straw and you plunged it down into the cake, the, the straw would fill up with the layers in the cake. You can then take it out and look at that straw and you'd be able to say, oh yeah, there's a nice rich uh, lemon layer in the middle of it. And I happen to like lemon in my birthday cake. So uh, I'm gonna eat, try and get a couple of pieces of that. Uh, so it's a way of understanding what, whether there's any mineralization, which might be the lemon layer, and what are the rocks there, because um, that helps you as a geologist find more deposits. Um, mineral exploration, it's all about searching for a hidden resource. And I put this cartoon, I've had it for oh, a couple of decades now, uh, and it's because these kids are all excited. They, they started digging and they're thinking, under six inches of dirt, oh, I've hit something. I maybe hit something exciting. Maybe it's a ju jewels. Uh, maybe it's a, a dinosaur fossil or part of one, or maybe it's a, uh, some sort of archaeological uh, artifact that they'd be interested in. And the reality is they've just hit a rock. Until they dig it up, they don't know what it is. Uh, and lots of Canada is covered by soil and places where we explore for minerals. And uh, in some cases, we also have glacial deposits uh, they've been deposited when the glaciers covered on large parts of Canada. And those cover up and make it much harder. If we're walking on bedrock, which we have in places in Saskatchewan and, and across Canada, then it's easier to know whether there's a uh, potential below you, but this does make it harder. But even, even, even if it's all rock, you, you may have to go down 100 meters, 200 meters to find the, the metals of interest that you're looking for or more. So Prospectors are out there. We, sh we showed you these two gentlemen before. Uh, they often work on their own, spending their own money. Why do they do that? They're trying to find a property that they can sell to a company which will pay their costs. And if this exploration company is successful, they'll get some payments as that property moves forward. They hike through the bush, walk into BC and uh, in certain parts of Saskatchewan on new logging roads. They follow creek beds. Uh, they use tools like a rock hammer, they have a GPS locator so that these days so they know where their samples come from. They use a gold pan if they're, to see if they can find what's in, in uh, broken up rock or in, in stream beds and the grub holes I mentioned. And uh, they, they are prospects are responsible for most of the metal mine finds uh, up until the 1960s, 1970s, when at least in some areas it's it become harder to find these deposits at the surface. Once exploration, oh, and I should also mention with prospectors, they, they in Saskatchewan and most uh, parts of, I think everywhere in Canada, if they're all only walking around and using a rock hammer, they do not require a permit. Uh, as long as they're allowed access to that land, they don't require a permit. If they were to start to do surface disturbance, they'd have to go to the government for a permit. Everything else I'm gonna talk about is gonna require in Saskatchewan and other provinces is gonna require permits to do that kind of exploration because there's gonna be some surface disturbance, whether it's uh, putting a drill in a location or whether it's building an access road to get there uh, or doing uh, on uh, some types of surveys, they all require permits. So small companies, junior companies are the ones that lead on exploration uh, across Canada. Well, Canada has some of the most uh, successful junior exploration companies in the world based in primarily in Toronto and Vancouver. Uh, and they not only explore in Canada, but they also explore around the world. Uh, and Canada is renowned for not only having good miners and, and exporting mining talent, but also for having good exploration uh, teams. So these companies are small, you know, several to tens of full-time employees, single office, their shares trade for cents to dollars, usually more in the cents range. 
Uh, many do not own a mine. So what does that mean? They have no source of income. People are investing in them the way they might invest in somebody developing a computer game. They only get money if they can sell that computer game to somebody else. Well, the same thing, the junior companies can only uh, make money uh, if they sell their exploration property or an interest in it to a, a company that can go ahead and develop it because these junior companies often don't develop the mines. And many of them don't exist for more than five to 10 years. Uh, some of the ones you'll see uh, in Saskatchewan are Fission Uranium Corp, which is doing exploration for uranium, Shore Gold, which is the company that was exploring for the diamonds. Uh, I think if I click now, you'll see that they changed their name. So that's another thing that junior companies will do. They'll need to sort of get a new infusion of, of financing. And so sometimes they change their name. It sometimes reorient what they're doing in Encanto. So here they are out uh, in early exploration still, collecting till silt samples, soil samples, uh, in some cases, uh, to just look for, see if they can find some indication of the metal they're looking for, the mineral they're looking for. They'll do rock sampling. Uh, here on the, on the bottom left, you can see that they're, uh, they're actually using a saw to cut a very long strip of a little narrow strip where they're extracting rock to get a representative uh, cross section of what that rock analyzes. They've definitely seen some mineralization there. And so they wanna know how, um, how predictable it is. A geological mapping, a, a geologist are gonna try and understand the, the environment where you're finding the mineralization to know where to look for the actual uh, zone that's going to be rich enough to mine. Geophysical surveys, you usually start in uh, early exploration into advanced exploration. Uh, you start in the air uh, using aircraft, either um, fixed wing or helicopters, uh, which gives you more granular data. And then you go to the ground to where you do surveys to get more detailed information and look further into the Earth's crust to see what you can find. Early exploration jobs, uh, prospector at a camp like this, one probably one prospector, line cutters, in, in, certainly in British Columbia and parts of Saskatchewan, you want to cut uh, lines so that you can know where you are in, in a strong, uh, heavily forested area. Samplers, drillers, kitchen helper, cook, probably a, a jack of all trades at the camp if it's larger to sort of keep things, the camp functioning. We go to advanced exploration and suddenly we're, we're, you're into the, taking the straw into the uh, cake to see the layering, you're drilling down, trying to collect the information. Uh, in Saskatchewan, drilling will often be done in the winter uh, and sometimes on lakes uh, because of uh, better access to some of the northern areas in the winter than the summer. Uh, this is actually one of the more expensive activities that you will do in, in, in exploration. Uh, and so you, for every property that's staked, you'll have some that sees early expiration, and then you'll see a smaller portion that'll see uh, advanced expiration and drilling. Geologists then get to look at the drill core. So you can see this guy's in a tent, he's got a notebook, he's just driving or what we call logging the drill core and collecting information, looking for mineralization, but also looking at the rocks to see if you can understand, okay, we didn't drill the hole in the right spot, but yes, this is promising a uh, place to drill some more holes. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about changing commodity prices and how it influences this exploration and mining by giving you two examples from Saskatchewan. So right now on the top on the right, you can see the potash graph. You see the blue line and uh, you can't, it's probably difficult to read the, the prices there, but the prices were very high uh, in the early 2000s and then it's dropped off and you can see it's actually dropped quite a bit lower. Uh, and, and so the prices are at a, a quite a low level, levels that we haven't seen uh, for potash since uh, before 2000. Well, this leads to a slowdown on developing new mines and ownership consolidation for the large potash industry. There's a steady demand for their product and so they can, they can survive this sort of price, uh, price uh, uh, drop. But if we look at uranium, uh, about um, 2000, and eight, the uranium price peaked, and then it started dropping off. So it's uh, so it had a very steep climb, then it's dropped and it's dropped, and then it's sort of stabilized at a lower level for the last number of years. Um, there's some suggestion in this graph from next gen, and they're exploring for uranium, so they like to be optimistic and think this way, that there's a second trend in increasing values of uranium, and that's helping them to track investment. 
one of the reasons why that uranium price might be going up is small modular reactors or SMRs are starting to be used more often as a way to combat greenhouse war, uh, gases and also to provide uh, secure and reliable uh, energy sources for remote, remote communities. Uh, and so some exploration companies are optimistic that the prices will, for uranium will rise. Well, at Potash, uh, I didn't have the graph, doesn't go quite that far. You can see in that little blue, might or might not be able to read it. It's about $212 per ton. Uh, this would be US dollars. Uh, on January 31st, it's 202. So it's uh, still sagging. So that's going to status quo there. We go to uranium. Uranium's uh, about 28. So it's up a bit from that lower line. Dave, you know, lower I'm level. sorry, Dave, we lost your presentation. You, oh, you lost it. Sorry. Uh, Sorry, excuse me. New share. You are screen sharing. Uh, hmm. Oh no, it's fine. It's back. It's back. Okay. <laughs> I think it's that mouse. I should go to a. Just hold on a sec. I'm going to just do something else different here. Uh, everybody can take just a quick breath while I. Uh, there's another way to avoid me. Is there a musical interlude we can introduce? Yeah, oh yeah, Paul, sing a song for us, please. <laughs> no, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no songs. The, uh, my apologies. The, this will be better, I think. Probably, that, that's quite a, an extensive explanation there, so it's probably good to uh, have a bit of a break here, sorry. We've done three others where we haven't had this problem, but then <laughs> you're dealing with Dave. So it, it's things can happen that way. Yeah, we saved all the glitches for the last one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you can see my screen with potash and uranium on it, correct? That's right, yes. Okay, uh, so I, I just pretty well finished on that slide. Uh, these price changes will affect early expiration and advanced expiration more than a mine because uh, you're trying to attract capital from investments from investors and, and they can sort of stop you sort of overnight. Right now, the uranium mines in, uh, in uh, Saskatchewan are all on what we call care and maintenance because uranium prices are so low that they can't produce. They know the uranium price is gonna come improve and that they're gonna sell more uranium. So they put them on care and maintenance so they can respond. But one of the mines in Northern Saskatchewan was losing $300,000 a day to keep their mine on care and maintenance. So that's, uh, you know, they. They're, they're expecting to turn around. So let's see. I thought this was going to make it better. Sorry. Okay. We just have to, I have to. So we look, think about these, uh, what's happening in mineral expiration. This is showing total expiration for Saskatchewan. And what it's uh, showing is that uh, the expiration uh, levels were quite low in Saskatchewan for quite a period of time. So you can see there's $100 million a year. And then when uranium prices took off, it really took off and got up to almost 500. And so much of this growth in expiration was related to uranium. Now it also coincided with a positive trend for metals like copper and gold. Uh, and, and so that also that has something to do with it. But mostly that's the uranium trend. And if I, uh, and it currently, it's estimated for 2020 to be $242 million spent on exploration. So that's, gives you a sense of how much economic opportunity is out there for Saskatchewan. And just to sort of, I overlaid here the uh, uranium prices, just to show that it's, it's uh, that there was this peak uh, in about 2008, uh, which uh, related to uranium and had, had to do with that. Well, what happened with the uranium exploration in the Athabasca Basin region? Uh, between 2003 and 2013, about 1.2 billion was spent just on uranium. And there were 16 new discoveries from hundreds of projects. And you, this, this is sort of the drilling, some of the drilling, uh, and this is some of the, all the tenure that was held in a particular part of the Athabasca Basin. Some of those new discoveries will eventually, uh, I think, become mines in, in, in Saskatchewan. They have, some of them are de mine development projects, but none of them have gone into production yet. And that's in part because we saw uranium prices sliding away and that's hard to develop a new mine when the prices 
uh, dropping. So here's the Athabasca Basin. It's a, a circular area in northern Saskatchewan, shown sort of diagrammatically here. And all the uh, mines and deposits, so there's mines are shown here by red dots and also deposits that haven't been developed, like West Bear has not been developed. These ones have uh, Millennium, which I'll talk about later, hasn't been developed. And some all the way over here. The only mine over on this side of the province is Clough Lake. And, uh, uh, but lots of exploration interests because they're anticipating the price of uranium is going to go up. So I'm going to talk about uh, some other exploration activities. I just thought this was a nice uh, website for Tyga Gold. They have some interesting information. They're focused on gold in Saskatchewan. So they're uh, very specific to the province. Here's their share price, 17 cents on uh, that particular time. You can see that it's, they regard that as important information to share on their home page. They have some properties in uh, sort of north central uh, Saskatchewan, east of Larange, and uh, extending sort of down close to Flintlawn. So they've got six properties. And part of this is they know that only one of these is, is, has any chance of becoming a mine. Statistically, uh, they would be quite lucky for even one of them to become a mine. And so they, they're looking at more things. Uh, they're east of where most gold is found in, in um, uh, gold mines, I should say, are found in Saskatchewan. But they are saying, well, there's this new CB gold mine that has only been in production in, for in the order of 10 or 15 years. We're going to look in that area because we think there's more gold there and we're doing grassroots exploration. And they actually have some advanced exploration going on on a couple of these properties. So they're using helicopters to get into these mode areas. They're collecting samples of soils and till to look for, for uh, gold in them. They're looking at rock outcrops. They're uh, doing drilling uh, uh, and uh, they're hoping that they can find it. And that's very typical of a company trying to do exploration and find new, uh, a new deposit which could become a new mine. This is a Pico property. It's a, an area with diamonds where they found diamonds. Uh, it's further north, uh, northeast of um, Prince Albert. It's in a new area. Uh, they discovered the diamonds in 2015 and have, have been doing exploration there to try and uh, uh, see if they can find a, a, some strong mineralization or potentially deposit. So that's an exploration example for diamonds. And there's team drilling, which I talked about before. And they've been, uh, they've been running diamond drilling training. It's used diamonds in, in drill bits because they're very uh, hard and so they can cut through uh, rocks and uh, allow the drill bit to proceed down the hole. And so they're, they're committed to not only training but using Indigenous uh, drillers and support, supporting um, Indigenous communities. Another sort of more entrepreneurial example of, of it came, comes from a friend of mine, Tom Lewis. And uh, here you can see uh, Lewis McCready was working for an exploration, his exploration company doing a geophysical survey. And he, here he's, you can see he actually has quite a large lunch, but he's well, and he's very well set up, but he's recording information while some other people out are moving to geophysical equipment. But he came up with the idea that, well, these drills need lots of wooden core boxes, the geologists, which the geologists store the core in, no reason why we can't go out and start building them. So he started building core boxes and selling them to that exploration company. I put this in because not every indigenous opportunity uh, for your community has to start as a big one. Often, sometimes it's better to start with something smaller uh, and get some experience, um, unless you're partnering with, with, with a group that has that experience. At this time, both sometimes in early exploration, but certainly in advanced exploration, you want to have environmental studies, lots of environmental sampling and monitoring to, to, so you know the baseline data for the property. Because if it's going to go ahead and develop into uh, a mine development project and a mine, uh, you need that baseline data to know better how to uh, deal with that site environmentally. And you know, obviously, if you're collecting that data, you're also making sure that your uh, exploration uh, project is, is not causing any problems. Now, typically, uh, even advanced exploration does not have uh, very much environmental impact beyond, uh, well, and I'll show you some pictures, of, I think, of, of reclaiming, but you, you do reclaim roads and, and stuff afterwards. So here's a couple of mid-sized exploration camps in northern Saskatchewan, one in the winter, which is active, uh, be related to a drilling program, and one that's uh, in the summer or fall. And uh, they're, they've been doing uh, sort of 
regional exploration in that area. And, and I think they went into a winter drilling program after that on specific properties. Advanced exploration jobs, unqualified mechanic, unqualified carpenter, unqualified electrician. That's just saying that there are sometimes uh, jobs on site where you can get training, but not necessarily be totally qualified. And, and we can see some of the other ones here. And this is a, a large exploration camp in Northern Saskatchewan. So exploration characteristics, early, smaller number of people, uh, junior companies, sometimes larger companies, spending maybe 50,000 to millions of dollars, uh, often summer field programs, sometimes winter drilling, and generally limited in impact. Uh, environmental impacts. You go to advance, more people, some larger companies involved with it, the junior companies that are involved with it uh, usually are a little bit more established. You can be spending up to hundreds of millions of dollars over years. Usually the field programs will go extend for multiple years and can be year round. Um, and they obviously provide more opportunities to provide exploration services, sign benefit agreements, and uh, generate jobs. And that that that's, does mean that as an economic development officer, you do need to think about who you're dealing with. That's part of the reason we're giving this information. But early on, uh, and it's you know it's a very small junior company. They only have a certain amount of capacity. They may have potential as the project grows, but there's a limit to what they can uh, do for you. So it's uh, you, you can't expect a, a small project to support a big demand. Um, and obviously, a small project is going to need less services and stuff. So here's an example, not from Saskatchewan because I couldn't find it, but this is from uh, Northern Quebec and it's a, a, a prospector who started doing a line cutting and staking for exploration companies in Northern Quebec. He got involved in mineral exploration. He started doing surveys and even developed, started using explosives. But he did it by building uh, a team of people who would do it and hiring people with the right skills and also doing some training within his community. And he's become a, a major employer for this Cree nation in Northern Quebec. Uh, and his name is Sam Bolson. Uh, and he's been doing it for nearly 50 years. And or more, well, it's been, now it'd be more than 50 years. He won a, a award from the Prospector Developers Association of Canada, the Scoop and Jim Award for uh, work he's done. So now we're gonna talk about mine development. And in mine development, the environmental studies continue. Uh, see bulk signing. This is from the uh, the diamond play near uh, Prince Albert. This is all coming from very large drill holes that were drilled, and what the, you can see the different colors. So that'd be one hole there, and there each of these holes are being sampled to see how much in the way of diamonds it has, because they need to find a certain number of diamonds of suitable quality and size to make it an economic deposit. And so you know this this pile here may actually be very good, or maybe it's it's a, not as productive a rock type. They have government, more government permits to get, very extensive and, and time consuming ones to uh, submit and be evaluated. They have to do their own economic feasibility studies so that they're, um, they're, they're clear that they can, if they're given a certain amount of money, they'll be able to develop the mine, put it into production and start getting income. Uh, and that it makes sense uh, that the return from the mine is gonna uh, offset the risk taken in, in, in having the money put in it. Then as a separate uh, process, they usually have to go to uh, different people and who actually have the funds and raise the funds to, to support the program. So they're thinking of the type of mineral, they're thinking of the market price of the minerals and the metals. Uh, so you would like, right now, you'd not be very keen on developing, going to the development stage for a uranium mine, uh, unless you really believe the price is gonna start to climb and certainly not for potash. Uh, you want good location and accessibility because if, if you don't have that, it's going to be more expensive to run the mine to get your product out from the mine. Uh, you like to have good access to infrastructure if you can get uh, the regulatory regime and including taxes and rolling taxes could make a difference in terms of whether your mine will be economic. Companies recognize that they are going to have to contribute uh, taxes, but if uh, at some point for a particular uh, deposit, the tax is maybe too high, uh, for the mine to operate economically. They have to be environmentally safe and socially responsible in Canada these days to attract investment. Well, the last thing that um, an investor wants to have is have a project stall because there are some problems in that area and it needs a qualified workforce. Senior companies, uh, which are the ones uh, typically developing the, the larger mines, they've been in existence for decades. 
and their name may have changed during that time. They have hundreds to tens of thousands of full-time employees, multiple offices. They have producing mines, so they have cash flow, and they sometimes have smelters or refineries or power plants associated with their mines that allow them to take a product that's come out of the mine and process it uh, to produce a different, uh, produce a more evolved product. And their stocks will trade for tens of dollars to sometimes hundreds of dollars. And in, um, in Saskatchewan, you may know some of these, Potash Corp, BHP Billiton, Cameco. Uh, Cameco is one of the major players for uranium up north. So in the mine development, we see some site preparation often done by contractors. During mine development, the number of people on site, it's often at least one and a half to two times as many people working for the contractors as they may have mine employees once the mine starts. Um, this is just, you know, they're building some plants on the right and they're doing some, uh, putting in some of the infrastructure in terms of piping and stuff to, uh, uh, on the left there, to the KNS uh, mine development, which is now a mine. The one on the left, uh, I'm going to talk to you them later, but Points Athabasca is a construction company, indigenous owned, uh, and I'll be talking about it later. So this is one of the big projects they've been involved with in over the years. Uh, Iraq structures, here you can see a camp being built for the, for the workers. Uh, this would be more a uh, mine development camp. Uh, I'm sure once the mine, once this project is completed, they will want to employ more local people in, in, and not have to bring in special mine development expertise. Uh, and so they might still have some of this for workers who are commuting from other places, but uh, they would probably be hoping to hire people more local. So Millennium, millennium Mine Development, uh, this is a Cameco project. It's up in uh, Northern uh, Saskatchewan. I did actually point it out briefly, but I'm not expecting you to remember that. Uh, and I'm not talking about the early history, but in 2008, Cameco, Cameco did one of these feasibility studies to prove that it's, it was a positive mine to do, and they were gonna do underground development planned from 2013 to 2017 to develop the mine prior to production. 2009, they started an environmental assessment process with the federal and provincial governments. Uh, the federal government being involved in this case because it's a uranium mine uh, would be the primary reason at least. I'm not sure if there are any other reasons. Uh, and Cameco, Cameco paid $150 million to buy out Ariba Resources in 2012 to get so that they owned the entire project. Unfortunately, remember we saw that uranium graph and it was in 2008, it peaked and then started falling. Well, if you look at the graph in detail, uh, 2014 didn't look so good and it looked like it could go lower. So they halted the project to wait for higher uranium prices. And there's, there's that graph again. Uh, there's 2009, well, it's dropped, but you know, we're still feeling pretty good. Uh-oh, May 2014, yeah, it's, it's, it's down there. So there's a, an impact of, uh, it's not stopped the project, it's sort of still on the books, but it stalled it, I would say, as people wait for higher prices to attract the investment for it. What's also interesting here, and part of the reason for mentioning this, is they signed a, an agreement with the English River First Nation. But it took quite a while for that agreement, if you think of those dates there when they were very active, for that agreement to get the collaborative agreement to be completed. Uh, and you can see there was, a, obviously there was some controversy there, which would obviously have something to do with it, and they dropped a, lo a lawsuit after they signed the agreement. The idea was that $600 million would flow to the First Nation over 10 years, contracts, wages to band members, uh, involvement, uh, other involvement. Well, unfortunately, if the, the, the project stalls, then obviously only some of that uh, project agreement would have reached fruition. Uh, on the other hand, I would be expecting that Millennium will be maintaining contact with First Nation. And I show this example to make, so you realize that you can't, if you can't make money, you can't blame a project for being stalled, even though uh, everybody would like to see it go ahead. So diamonds in Canada, uh, we have uh, a diamond line, Victor in um, Ontario, another one, the Renard in, which is more an exploration project. Uh, I don't know if it's gone into production, but the producing mines, other than Victor, are all up in the Northwest Territories. And, uh, but what we learned is that Saskatchewan has diamond potential here uh, near Prince Albert, and then also north up in here with that exploration project I showed you. So for our car is a diamond project. They're spending, uh, expecting to spend about $105 million uh, 
uh, developing the project and, and uh, as a mine development project. Sorry, Diamond. Uh, mining can be an economic development stepping stone for uh, indigenous communities. And this is for the uh, Sekitawak Development Corporation, SDC, uh, for the northern village of Il Ala Cross. And you can see they also have SDC Construction Limited. Uh, SDC invests in regional community businesses across multiple sectors. That's great. But they started with a, a hundred owned subsidiary construction company uh, servicing a, a mine site. And so that allowed them to acquire uh, train heavy equipment operators and develop construction labor and acquire equipment. And they've since transitioned into community services and are, uh, I'm sure, still prepared to work uh, on uh, mine projects, mine development projects and mine projects. But sometimes that local mine, that nearby mine can be the stepping stone to having a, a development corporation or a, a construction company that can do uh, grow grow with the mine initially, and then branch out and, and find other ways of uh, finding contracts and, and producing jobs. So now we're going to talk a bit. Well, so this is explain the metal mine marathon. Excuse me. So uh, and this that should be actually one thousand properties or state uh, in terms of this thing. So if you think of a mine marathon, what um, one of the things that you can expect in a marathon is that not all the runners are gonna finish the race. Uh, obviously there'll be one winner and uh, maybe some people close to that person, but it's a very demanding uh, long-term race, if you will. And we do not expect everybody to finish it. The interesting thing about finding a metal mine is that you might have a thousand properties, so substitute a thousand or 10,000 that were staked. Well, okay, so where does that go? Well, you might have hundreds of mineral exploration properties come out of that. A lot of properties that are staked the prospector can't actually find uh, somebody to work on it or a junior company that picks it up, finds that the, you, the commodity price has dropped and so they can't afford to go in the field and explore it and then they let it drop. So from the hundreds of mineralization properties, we get to several metal mine development projects. And then if you're lucky, that results in one or more metal mine. So it's in this case, this is a really tough marathon to get to uh, a, and a very relatively time consuming to get to that metal mine. Not as much statistical risk for uh, uh, industrial minerals usually. And like the potash deposits, we have a much better understanding of where to find them. Uh, it becomes more uh, uh, necessary just to test to see if they uh, have enough um, of, of the potash mineral in it to mine them. So characteristics of working in a high risk environment, if you think about this, well, let's think of what is another high risk environment. If you're a tightrope walker, you're, you tend to be very careful to reduce all other things that might influence it when you go out on the tightrope um, the, the next day. So you avoid having a, a, a fight with your, your uh, family members. You uh, want to know and look at the weather conditions because you don't want to have a high wind. You want to check the rope or the wire you're going to be walking on. You want to check all these things. So you have to remember with this risk profile, um, Exploration companies can be scared away from an area by governments that don't recognize how they operate and maybe overtax, change the tax structure in a way that they can't be economic. Uh, exploration companies uh, can be, you know, they're, they're just, they're, because they have this major risk in trying to get to success, other factors can have an impact on them. So I just thought, it's just sort of interesting to think about in terms of how some things will play out. So Saskatchewan potash and salt producers, eight underground, and three solution mines. They operate for decades. Off, uh, the one, there's a number that have been operating for more than 40 years and have uh, significant life, mine life left in them. Hundreds of workers, Quarry Mine in 2012 had about 500 people, and there's a spin off jobs. Uh, there's a, the head frame here for, with the elevator shaft to take people and uh, equipment up and down, but also to bring the potash to the surface, which will come out and be carried out here. This is just some underground mining equipment in a very large workshop area. The, the actual underground mining areas are smaller than that. And there's a silver. Okay, and just showing their locations and here's Regina, Saskatoon. You can see the red and green dots show where, where these uh, mines are located. An area view of a potash plant and uh, with also uh, some of the water they're using in, in, in processing the potash coming from the mine operation over here. Oops, what's... 
Sorry. Um, my apologies. So this is a legacy potash process project, which became a Bethune mine. I showed you uh, some of the uh, construction pictures from that one. So uh, it's got a, a mine life of approximately 40 years. Construction began in June 2012. Uh, they started in 2017. So it took five years uh, of construction, $3.25 billion to, uh, to build it. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, a mine life. Um, sorry, it's the first new solution mine in Saskatchewan 40 years, but a mine life of 55 years. Uh, there are actually three solution mines. That's uh, the newest one. And these are the two solution mines that were previous producers. All workers are on surface. They pump solution down. They uh, capture the potash in a brine, bring it, pipe it back up to the surface and extract it. This, this is a technique that is used to reach potash uh, deposits at greater depths rather than using traditional mining. And here's points of Athabasca, which I mentioned. It's 75% owned by the Athabasca Basin Development, an industry leading contracting form, quality and safe work with an Aboriginal workforce. And what I liked about this is they're talking about over the last three years, our clients have hired 100 employees from our projects for long-term positions. We, we view this as not just one, but over 100 success stories. So these workers here uh, get the initial experience with points Athabasca, but then uh, quite often uh, take those skills and move to another company. And I thought that was uh, really exceptional. Salt production, there's a huge salt resource in Saskatchewan. It's also produced as a byproduct of potash mines. And uh, there are some solution mines associated with it. And it's used obviously on highways uh, in the winter. It's also used small amounts for table salt, but also salt is used a lot uh, as in commercial applications. Uranium mines. So this may be a bit clearer picture to understand. So here's Uranium City. Here's the Athabasca Basin, in this case shown in black. And here you can see Clough Lake, which is closed. It's been closed for quite a while, but that was the only year uranium mines developed so far in this part of the Athabasca Basin. Uh, but you can see there's a number of mines right here, some of them uh, and some deposits. So Midwest is a deposit. It's got a known resource, but it hasn't been developed yet. It's waiting for uh, uh, higher prices and enough demand for its product. Um, but you can see there are other mines here like Rabbit Lake, it's on care and maintenance. Cigar Lake is the largest one, it's on care and maintenance. And uh, these mines were also impacted by COVID-19 as were the um, potash mines, but these ones were because they're remote were impacted more. And so that, that combined with the lower uranium prices made it 2020 a very difficult year for the uranium mines. Uh, so I'm just going to show you some pictures of both their Cigar Lake mine uh, and you can see uh, some of the underground work they're doing and their uh, head frame. They have a separate plant and the, these plants are usually have supported older mines that are now closed and in this case the McLean Lake plant had some mines right around it but now uh, it's no longer being supplied by local mines. It's been getting ore. The, uh, to be processed at the plant from Cigar Lake. Uh, so using the same uh, facilities. And you can see this, this would be quite a large operation and would require uh, a considerable number of workers. Also, you can see because of the, the, the risk nature of these projects, you often get uh, multiple owners involved in these uh, mines. Eagle Point Mine, you can see here's, this has actually got a ramp to provide access to go underground, sort of a, an inclined tunnel. And you can see them working underground here. Uh, and it's got another the Rabbit Lake plant, which is associated with that mine. You can see another large uh, facility. Here you have got the number of employees, 650, and 50% of them are residents from the north. I'm sorry, I don't know the indigenous uh, participation. So these operations use, uh, move all their supplies on winter roads in the winter. And so here NRT, Northern Resource Trucking, uh, is, is doing a lot of this work and this is just, you know, they check sections that are on, long sections that are on lake to make sure the ice is thick enough and suitable quality. And they invented a way to actually test, just drive along and test the thickness rather than using chainsaws to cut the ice to see the thickness. They have partners and you, that's, that's another uh, aspect I think of a lot of indigenous companies is to work with partners to uh, 
find new opportunities for where you can get work. Uh, and along those lines, the uranium industry in Saskatchewan is slowing down. We saw the price dropping. The demand for supplies is dropping as mines are reducing uh, amount of production and, uh, and then they're into care and maintenance. And so they need to start looking. They looked around and saw that uh, up until then, I think they've been working essentially in Saskatchewan. They saw there was a new, go uh, new gold mine being operated by New Gold in Northwestern Ontario that was uh, under construction. They formed a limited partnership with the Big Grassy River First Nation from that area in Ontario and formed a partnership. Uh, they landed, together they landed a contract hauling lime from Faulkner, Manitoba to the New Gold Mine. Later they added other products they're doing. And as of spring 2020, they had six NR NRT trucks and 10 trailers stationed in Manitoba and they had an office there. Uh, and so they, you have to sort of, once you have a company like this, the mining industry is uh, in some cases like Flon and Thompson, it's been quite static with long-term production, but it's not always uh, predictable. So again, using, you can use your experience in the uranium industry to expand and go to some, something else. Gold mines in uh, Saskatchewan is only one producing right now. You can see the CB mill site there and, and it's processing ore from the Santoy mine, which is some, uh, some distance away from where the mill site was, where the original small mine operating was, was located. Um, there, um, they recorded 112,000 ounces of gold produced uh, and that's approximately worth $200 million at today's gold price. So. Uh, a significant operation. Gold mining in the area dates back to the 1930s and there are a number of mines that have been produced, but in the Larange Gold Belt, which if you remember from the slide I showed you, it's further to the west. The coal mines, I mentioned there was uh, uh, two mines in uh, three pits and two, mi two mining areas in the south, off the river and Esteban coal mines, about $10 million. It's 60% of your province of electricity comes from power there. Sand and gravel operations, uh, uh, and these are around Saskatoon. Oops. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Uh, we need to think about sand and gravel. It, it actually, as a, an individual commodity, was the third ranked mineral commodity in Saskatchewan in 2001. And uh, there were about 19 companies uh, in 2000 with about 183 employees, uh, but there would have been a lot of other people uh, moving aggregate. Uh, it's used mainly in road construction. Uh, it belongs, sand and gravel belongs to the property owner when obtainable from the surface, and that may. Uh, in some cases, uh, influence what you might be able to do on reserve uh, lands if you were interested in it. Uh, on Crown land, sand and gravel rights are administered by government through the Ministry of Environment and Ministry of Agriculture in Saskatchewan. So a different, different agency than uh, what's done for minerals and metals. And one of the things you have to think about with sand and gravel, it's location, 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 because the uh, if you're more than say 20 kilometers away, your trucking costs are gonna be so high that you probably can't compete with other producers unless you're in a particularly poor location for sand and gravel. Alkali lakes, uh, these can be used to produce sodium, magnesium, and sulfate. And uh, they're sort of mined by pumping water into smaller areas and, and, and evaporating the water and producing these salt uh, products, but specialized products. And it's Saskatchewan is now another world leader in, in natural sodium sulfate, which is kind of interesting, but less significant than the phosphate. Here's a plant just showing some of the, what the site looked like, should you ever drive by one. Now I'm gonna talk about reclamation and uh, I think I'm okay here with where we are in the timeline. So we've got, there are some abandoned mine sites that we've had them all across Canada. Unfortunately, early on uh, in mining, first we had very small mines that often had very little limited impact, but over time, just as farms are larger now than they used to be, uh, stores and on average are much larger than they used to be. Mines tend to be to be look, seeking efficiencies of scale. And so a lot of mines are larger now. And uh, so these older mines, sometimes smaller, uh, were often 
not uh, closed and reclaimed properly. And so the Saskatchewan Research Council has gone, uh, has gone back to these sites near Uranium City in the north to uh, decommission them and clear them up. And uh, you can see in this picture here, the picture in the bottom, there's been uh, work to um, recontour and, and cover some old uh, tailings from, the, from a uranium mine. Um, just gonna show you some close and, and de de decommissioned uranium mine sites here. This is more for the pictures. So here's a pit, 1998. Uh, it's filled with water, but it's not been, uh, and it's, there's no more mining, obviously. Uh, here's the initial attempt at uh, filling it in and reclaiming and recontouring it. And there's part of the recontoured area where the, some of the waste rock was there growing vegetation on it. So uh, cleaning up that site. And then if we go to the plant for that particular Clough Lake, remember that was on the extreme west side of the Athabasca Basin. There's the plant site uh, sort of just before the mine's gonna close, but maybe not operating still. And that's what it looked like before revegetation and other work, but uh, after the site had been cleared of all buildings and, and um, was getting ready for further reclamation. Uh, here's the Contact Lake Gold Mine. Before you can see the, some of the buildings and some of the clearings, it's been cleared and contoured, and then it's in the process of being revegetated. Coal mine reclamation, they're strip mines. And so uh, as they go along, they stockpile soil and, and some of the, ro and the rock they're moving. Then they put the rock back first in the soil and uh, they end up with reclaimed farmland or wetlands. So it's uh, uh, a very good way of doing it. So last thing I wanna to talk to is learn your ABCs of mine. These are directed at sort of economic development officers. Three important ones are financial risk, which I have been talking about, a key factor for mining projects. Assets for safety, safe heavy industry, highly regulated in Canada, and time. It's a time to find, permit, build a major mine. So for mineral exploration and mine development in particular, you need investors to support those projects. Those investors have to move their uh, investments if the commodity prices tumble or not put them in. Uh, they need to worry if the new mines start producing, but the demand for that commodity uh, drops. Uh, and so I've talked about that. And you can see they, they can put their money into a mine or maybe into some farmland or into a new uh, grocery chain. So they're, they're, it's a very competitive environment. And so it's very risk oriented. Safe operations at mines. Uh, the mining industry is one of Saskatchewan's safest. I talked about government workers and, and uh, lost time accidents. Uh, and uh, this is something that's improved dramatically from historical mining uh, across Canada. And uh, it's, we're proud, those of us who work in the industry are proud that mining is the safest heavy industry in the, problem, in, in the country, in our province, British Columbia and Saskatchewan, but across the country. Uh, so it, you want to find exploration, maybe at least three years to find a metal deposit and significant resource. Uh, permit at least two to three years to permit it and construct it at least two years to build a major mine, major metal mine or potash mine. As we saw, the potash mines are taking longer than that. And what, where that becomes important is if the prices stay high and investment funds are available, the mine develops and, and opens. Um, so if that window of opportunity investment funds is not as, uh, as broad, it's not over as much time, the mine development project can slow down or can stall or it can stop and not restart. And it's just talking about that mining marathon and potash mines in Saskatchewan have very, been very much affected by these windows of opportunity. So we have some very big mines like the Janssen mine, uh, which is still being developed, but they're going slower at it because they're waiting, for, they, they wanna spend less money now and more money close to when the potash prices recover. I'm just trying to, so you understand the industry a bit more. Uh, I added another one here, W equals world leader in mining best practices. Uh, so that the Mining Association of Canada has got a towards sustainable mining uh, initiative and they want the mines to be more accountable to local communities. They want to be, be more transparent and more credible. And they are, uh, have enrolled uh, a number of the major companies including Cameco in Saskatchewan into it. Uh, interestingly enough, and here is their 
their guidance and, and direction for communities and people, how to connect with them, environmental stewardship and energy efficiency. What's neat about this is this uh, mining best practices code has been adopted by eight other countries, Argentina, Australia, Botswana, Brazil, Finland, Norway, the Philippines and Spain. So we're, we're setting a trend here in Canada. If you want more information about the sector, go to the Saskatchewan Geological Survey's annual uh, exploration and development highlights. You see the 2021 there. Uh, and there's the mining information sources and that takes us to question and answer. Over to you, Carmel. Hi everyone. Um, so thank you guys for showing up, uh, for attending our session this afternoon. Um, just to let you know that it is being recorded and will be available afterwards. And so will the um, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and does anybody have any questions at this moment? If you do, please turn your camera on or just your mic. Did you have any last comments, Dave, that you want to share with, with us? Um, I guess, oh yeah, there's definitely one thing I wanted to mention. Thanks for reminding me. Um, this is quite a high level general uh, overview of both opportunities for indigenous communities to get involved in the mining all the way from early exploration all the way to mine closure. And the point I wanted to make about mine closure, which I didn't make is that if you're living in a community close to a mine that is, has closed, but where they're gonna be monitoring it for five years to 10 years, the monitoring is usually done intermittently. Maybe every two weeks, you're taking water samples every month, you're doing some other sampling, you're doing a visual inspection, maybe you're, uh, maybe there's some, some other things you're doing. And so it, the company would rather prefer to be able to hire somebody locally uh, rather than to, uh, you know, either have somebody from the company uh, stationed there, but who, who would not have work for most of the time. Or, and so local, local contractors will have an, an edge on getting that type of work and it could fit in with doing other things for them. Uh, the other thing is I think indigenous companies have an extra card to play because they have a, a deep interest in the land and they, uh, they are gonna bring credibility to the, the fact that that testing is being done in an appropriate and respectful manner. And that kind of training can actually, you know, can be quite useful in terms of developing an interest or skills that might take you into perhaps a different career than you anticipated. The other one is, this was, is very much an introduction. Well, yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Okay, oh, yeah, let's go to the question. Uh, right. I'll just mention, there is more information available uh, from the, uh, the federal government for Natural Resources Canada they produce this guide called Exploration and Mining Guide for Aboriginal Communities. It's available online. It'll be listed in our uh, references and it gives you a much more detailed than I was able to have in my time uh, explanation of, of the life cycle of mining and various aspects of it. But yes, questions, sure. Um, hi, Clement uh, DeRocher. Did you wanna unmute yourself and just ask Dave directly or would you like me to read it? Okay, well, um... Hello. Yeah, just, uh, I'm interested if there's any uh, exploration activities in the northwest, northwest boreal region, uh, just uh, north of the air weapons range there in that area. How would I find out if there's anything going on? Well, that, the, the, that report I mentioned by the Saskatchewan Geological Survey is a good place to start. Um, if you have aptitude uh, on a computer, you could go and, and use another link, which will be listed in, in the information reply, resupply. And you can see if there are any mineral tenures in that area, i.e. have people picked up claims. If they picked up claims, then maybe there's some activity there. Um, I wouldn't hesitate to phone that, uh, if you're quite interested, to phone the geological survey, who, who uh, they're not gonna know all the activity across the province, because Saskatchewan is a very active province, but they're, they're likely to be able to answer that question. Unfortunately, I don't know the province in detail enough to, to answer it for you. But so look at the uh, Saskatchewan regional uh, summary. Uh, they won't catch really, it won't capture really early stage projects that they've just started. But if there's any, any sort of significant sort of uh, exploration projects or they've been around for a while to capture that, it'll certainly capture advanced exploration projects, mine developments and mines. Um, and um, I, yeah, and 
I guess the, so that's, those are the easiest answers. Uh, if you had somebody in your community who was knowledgeable, you know, not necessarily, you know, knowledgeable about sort of mining activities and stuff, they might know as well. Um, we yeah. had a, we had a, re, uh, some bridges built on uh, some stream crossings. They were upgraded and they're uh, top of the line there and there's not much traffic going on there, but the bridges look really brand new, eh? That's why we're, uh, we're at the Bor Alberta border. On yeah. The, and uh, certainly the, the oil and gas doesn't stop at the border. So that's what we're, we're concerned about. Yeah. Maybe there's something going on there. How far, sorry, uh, the, uh, I almost need to look at a map, to, but, but I'd still be, uh, I'm not the right person to ask. Uh, if you send, uh, send us, um, uh, maybe we can capture your information, maybe send the information by in, in, a, um, uh, in the chat box, give us a, an email address or a phone number, and I'll see if I can get somebody from the Geological Survey to uh, talk with you. All right, thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, and th that on the ground knowledge that something's happening, i.e. infrastructure's improving or there suddenly seems to be more activity of people who are not normally in the region. Obviously that can be oil and gas, can be other things, but it also could be exploration. And uh, uh, I think that more exploration companies, more prospectors are prone now to, to go and if they come through a community that's nearby, that's First Nations, to start providing information voluntarily early on. But if you see that kind of activity, you have to ask yourself, is this, it could be related to mining or it could be related to something else, but uh, yes, you want to find out. Um, so we do have a comment from uh, Kelly Fridler, just wanting to know if there was any update on Star Diamond. Yeah, okay, that's the one year Prince Albert. Um, the, what I told you is, is quite current. Um, she, they, she joined uh, us pretty late. Oh, oh, sorry, okay. Well, the update is essentially they, they are a mine development project. They changed their name from uh, Shore Gold to Star Diamond. They sort of restructured the, the high level organization in the company. They have collected a lot of data. They've done these boreholes. I was on site when I was there, in, uh, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago. And th th they're drilling these big holes that are uh, maybe a three meters, a, well, what, say a meter and a half across to bring up a lot of rock so they can get a, a large volume of it to see how much there is in the way of diamonds. And some of those holes will have drilled rock that has no diamonds, but a number of the holes drilled uh, rock which have diamonds in it, including macro diamonds, which are the ones that are larger ones and are, have more value. Um, they're, they're at that point where they have to convince people who will invest the funds that yes, we have found enough, we've done enough work to define a large enough deposit that if we mine it, you're gonna make money not lose money. Um, and so I'm not familiar in, with the details. Again, the Geological Survey of Saskatchewan could tell you more details, but they are a mine development project. They're, they, they've sort of repositioned themselves as this new name, newly named company, but st still bringing some of that expertise with them. Uh, I suspect that's allows them to raise some more funds and they're, um, they're you know, if, if we're talking, about, we talked about a thousand companies in metal mines, diamond mines are fairly similar. So if you had a thousand properties staked, uh, they've got to the point where it's in a mine development stage. So they have a, uh, they still, still not for sure that they're gonna be a diamond mine, but they're a lot closer to, to possibly being a diamond mine. Uh, and I, I think they probably don't have to do much more in the way of exploration to define the resource. They have to do more evaluation of how, how costly is it going to be to mine it and how many of those diamonds are we, are we going to be able to recover and, and sell and, and make money from? Hopefully that gives you some general information. Exciting though, exciting to think that you might have diamonds in, in Saskatchewan, uh, well you have diamonds, but you might actually have your first mine there. Uh, Manitoba and Alberta both have interesting potential for diamonds, but they have no projects or anywhere close to what's happening uh, on the Star Diamond project. They just have oh. expiration potential at this point. My mother is actually from uh, Saskatchewan and she's from one of the First Nations just north of Prince Albert. And I remember they were talking about diamonds. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. Oh. Yeah, so I, I think that's all for our questions. Oh wait, uh, Kelly Fiddler says, Waterhead and Canoe are on the shield potential for diamonds. 
Well, the Canadian diamonds form uh, from deep beneath the Earth's crust. And so they form, uh, you need these shields to produce conditions so that you have these special type of rocks that come up from great depth, carrying the diamonds, which have been formed under really high pressure and temperatures, and bring them really quickly in a geological sense to the surface. And so the, we think of the Canadian Shield as sort of being, you know, maybe a bit of northern Saskatchewan into Manitoba, Ontario, and up to the north. But uh, all when you when you're in Saskatoon or Regina, you're sitting on top of sedimentary rocks, but beneath it is the Canadian Shield, and so the and uh, Prince Albert. So these these same rocks have come through the Shield, which is where they form, but they come up through the the younger sedimentary rocks right to the surface. So it's People weren't necessarily expecting to find diamonds there initially, and uh, they have. So it's great because they're they're younger. They're much younger than when the shield rocks. Uh, and in this case, so they're also cutting the younger uh, overlying sedimentary rocks. Well, we're at 3.30 now, and I just wanted to thank everybody for coming this afternoon and uh, for Natural Resource Canada for funding our project. And um, Dave Lefebvre for sharing all your experience and knowledge in the mining field. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.